My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Monday, February 14th, 2011. I'm interviewing Anita Fields for the Oklahoma Native Artists Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral Histories Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're in Stillwater at Anita's house. Thank you for taking time to speak with me, Anita. You're welcome. You began your professional career a bit later in life, but your unique approach to ceramics, including your renderings of cultural items in clay, has made you very sought after. You're a member of the Osage tribe, but you're also Muscogee Creek, is that mm -hmm. right? Is that on your mom or your dad's side? I'm Osage on my dad's side, and I'm Creek on my mother's side. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was born in Hominy, Oklahoma. And I grew up till about uh, eight to ten in uh, Osage County in Hominy. We lived on my uh, great grandfather's allotment. My dad built a home out there, but then we made a uh, move to Colorado, and uh, back and forth to Co for so there was a couple of years there that we made. You know, they couldn't get quite settled in, in Colorado, and they were very homesick, so we kept moving back and forth to Oklahoma, and we finally settled in Colorado. I lived there and until I was about eighteen. You didn't happen to know the Greys while you were there, did you? The Greys are my relatives, so we kind of made that move. They were in Denver, yeah. yeah, too. Yeah, we were all up there together. Right. What did your folks do for a living? My dad was a guide and outfitter, but he was also a welder, and my mom uh, was a housewife. And what are your earliest memories of art? Mm, my earliest memories <laughs> of art are in uh, Oklahoma out there on my great-grandfather's allotment that I was talking about earlier. And uh, memories of a uh, very hot Oklahoma summers, playing in the dirt and making mud pies. My mom would save those little tins, you know, the little pie tins, little bitty ones, like bound pies. And then I would mix water and the earth and grass and pebbles <laughs> and uh, put them on a board, let them dry in the sun. Very much like what I do today. But also just memories of, uh, you know, being creative, of, of creating things with natural materials. And in also, three dimensions. Mm -hmm. But another thing that I talk about quite a bit is my earliest memories of, of making things are that my grandmother on my mother's side sewed. She was a really, really wonderful seamstress, and so she would sew. And, you know, I really don't even know how young I was, but I think I was like six or something, uh, six or seven. And I asked her to teach me how to sew. So she gave me some scraps and she taught me how, you know, basic sewing. And so I started making these little doll clothes for a favorite doll of mine. And they're uh, very vivid in my memory of what they look like. And so I have a, um, still today a fondness for material and textiles and sewing which I still incorporate a lot, you know, fabric into my right. work and uh, clothing. I mean, it's just an extension of kind of the things that I learned early, early on. What kinds of art experiences did you have in like primary and secondary school? Uh, in Colorado, in Oklahoma, I don't, I don't recall much except that the, you know what I'm talking about, what I did at home. And, but in Colorado, we went to uh, parochial schools, and there were um, a, there was a really old nun. I think when I was in third grade, she came once a week and taught us art. And today, as an adult, when I th when I think about her, I, I really enjoy these memories because she was really, really quite passionate about artwork, and she taught us how to make a fresco, a real fresco, the way that you know it's been historically done. Which is really kind of amazing for third graders. Wow! And then Wait, she, you know, she was just very passionate about and her love for art. And so, uh, one of the things that she asked us to do was to create ourselves out of in a collage. She taught us what a collage was and how to make a collage. And then she said, "I want you to create what it is you see yourself being when you grow up in collage form." And I made an artist, and she had a little tam on, and she had a smock on, and she was holding <laughs> a palette. I, you know, and. And then she taught us, I mean, she just taught us some techniques that you just don't learn in third grade normally. So <laughs> those, uh, I remember that pretty vividly. But unlike today when people have lots of opportunities inside communities, you know, to make artwork or to go to a place that, that has classes, those were not so uh, available to us when we were young. There was a place that 
uh, talk kind of crafty things, like some kind of community center, and I remember going to that a couple times. But I was the kind of child that got really immersed in when if I was making something, creating something, and it was just kind of a self-taught um, activity. I mean, I would just get whatever we had at home and start making things, whether that was sewing, you know, making a costume to wear to a party, or just making things. And my dad, my dad was a pretty good painter, so I, wa I watched him paint, and I think, you know, the, the activity of making things or creating was, was uh, that language. Right. It's real comfortable for us. Right. And nobody told you don't do that or spend your time doing something else. And so we were just kind of left alone to explore those kinds of activities and the activity of, cre of creating something and making something. But I do remember, and this this uh, awareness came to me after I started doing the artist in residence program here in Oklahoma, you know, many years ago, watching children who never had the opportunity to work with clay, but it was just came very natural to them. And there was two or three kids out of a hundred kids that you'd see in a day. There'd be two or three kids that was just, I can't leave this material. I don't want to go back to the classroom. I'm all immersed. And I thought, oh, that's the kind of kid I was. <laughs> you know, I saw myself in them. Those are the potential artists. Mm -hmm. So you got, obviously, re not only sort of that um, quiet encouragement, but some reinforcement mm -hmm. from your folks for, for being creative in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, you went to school at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, were your parents in favor of you going there? And she have to talk them. I know Gina had to talk her folks into it a little bit. <laughs> Gina was really young. When she went <laughs> yeah, she there. was very young. Yeah. Was um, no, not really. You know, I graduated high school, and so. You know, it was my decision, and they were okay with that. Right. What was your, um, was pottery your focus there too? Or no, I went to the IIA to paint. I I had you know dabbled in painting, and and so I went out there to, to paint. But when I went out there, you know, we were exposed to so many mediums, and uh, one of them was video and uh, multimedia, uh, clay. Sculpture. I mean, we were just really exposed to all kinds of things, and so that was my first time to to work with clay, and I really, you know, it was, I really liked it, but I didn't really pursue clay until you know leaving I I. I see. Yeah, there was a, a a few years there that, well, when I left I I, you know, I got married and started having a family, so my art was kind of always on the side. Or if I had a job, I was just making sure that I was at some community art center or some university where I could, I could, you know, take classes, and so I would have access to a studio, and so I did that for a long, long time. Who were um, some of aside from meeting Tom there, and I want to talk about that in a minute, but some of your um, fellow classmates and maybe some of your favorite teachers at the institute. Um, well, there was a lot of people that were, you know, really, we were, that were very influential on each other. John Kindred was a painting instructor there, and he was uh, a, a great, a great teacher, uh, a great person to, you know, to give you motivation and encouragement. Um, I took paint, uh, printmaking from Seymour Tubas, and he was another great teacher. Um, one thing that about these guys that was really cool was that if they saw some, you know, talent in you, that they would uh, buy your work or they would trade with you. And so Even had, the teachers? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, not all of them. Two or three of them would do that. Um, Ralph Partington was the um, clay instructor that, that I had. There was a couple, uh, you know, Ali was there, but... She did more of the traditional. So uh, I have uh, Ralph Ali, Partington. Do you want to? Oh, I can't give. Let's see. Is it Lola? It's not it's a Loma, is it? Lola Ma. Lola Ma. I think. I think. I mean, okay. we may have to. I just can't recall right. Yes, that's all right. But, um, <laughs> Alan Hauser was there in sculpture. Um, 
but you know, I didn't always have those instructors. I mean, we right. had, um, but in terms of students, Mike Romero was a great painter that we all admired. And, um, Oh my gosh, there were so many people from so many places. Gordon Van Wert, you know, was a sculpture student. Um, of course, Gino was there painting. Um, I mean, I could name love a lot of people. <laughs> I could go on well, and on. Well, tell about meeting Tom, I guess. <laughs> well, Tom was a, a going to film school there. Okay, at? Uh, I don't even know what the name of that, that place was. Like Richard was there, Richard, Richard and him, and there was a couple yes, other guys. Yes, it, it wasn't St. John's College, was it? Or... It might have been there, but it was, you know, some, it was a program okay. that was going. But I actually met Tom in Denver. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Like during so one of during... the holidays. But then, well, you know, everybody's kind of running around these huge crowds, <laughs> you know. It's back and forth, all these places that we would travel to, so. During your high, during your high school days, then. No. Or, okay, later on. Right, right. Right, after, yeah. after leaving the Institute. Well, no, or I was still at the school. Institute, but I think we were on break or something, gotcha. so. And um, you knew that he was into photography, or was he into mm -hmm. photography at that mm -hmm. point? Yeah, and that was another thing that I had taken out there at the Institute of American Indian Arts was uh, photography with Kay Wiest. Ah. Uh, and she was really... She really knew what she was doing in that old school, you know, type of photography. I mean, she was a contemporary of um, um, Georgia O'Keeffe and that crowd. Mm -hmm. So she really, really knew what she was doing. I remember that about her. So while you were um, raising your kids, you still kept your hand sort of in, uh, in art mm -hmm. and you were mentioned that you took some classes. Um, does this include the class at OSU with Richard? Mm, no. Or I mean, that was that later? That was later. Um, one of the things I've always done, uh, one of the things that I, when I was, uh, when my kids were very, very young and I was pregnant, was we lived in Pahuska. Tom was working for the Osage tribe. And so I made an effort to learn how to do ribbon work. They had these classes that you could go up to the museum. And so, um, I learned how to do ribbon work, I learned how to do finger weaving, and I would just, thought, well, I have this time, you know, I might as well learn how to be, you know, doing these things. And so, um, I spent some time, you know, making traditional Osage clothing for little relatives, or, and then, right. you know, when my kids, you know, came along, started, you know, doing that for them. Right. So, um, I was doing those kinds of things. I think I took a class from Bill, Cla uh, Bill Glass one time in Tahlequah. Oh, that's um, when interesting. When we were in Tahlequah. Uh, well, I know I did. I'm not my think. I mean, I, I did take a class from When he Bill. was the artist in residence for Cherokee Nation. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Were you sort of thinking, I'd like to do some more of this? Yeah. At that and of course, time? I knew Bill from IIA. Right. You know, Bill was um, another person that was out there at the same time I was. Talented Bill Glass. <laughs> So when did you did you get involved with the artists uh, in residence program prior to your class at OSU or after? After. Okay. After. Let's talk so about I had spent that all this class. Time. Okay. okay. I had spent all this time going back and forth to schools, and but every time I would get enrolled in the school, I would I would get pregnant and have another child. So when we moved to, when we moved we lived in Tahlequah for quite a while. And so then Tom got a job with the, you know, the career tech. And so we moved to Stillwater. Approximately and, what year? Oh my gosh, we've been here 25 years. Okay. So we've been here quite a while. I mean, we've raised our kids here. They were little when we left Tahlequah. So um, I thought I couldn't find a job. I was really having a hard time finding a job here. So I had to work for Cherokee Nation when we lived in Tahlequah. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go back to school. And I didn't have much to, you know, to finish. I mean, right. I just had this really hodgepodge of classes <laughs> and um, different, you know, degrees of, um, you know, advanced painting, but, you know, no beginning what they required over here. So I just I really had this hodgepodge. So, you know, I, I, uh, Marty Averett was there at OSU. 
And so um, Marty helped me get through all this, you know, he said, well, what I needed to take in order to graduate. And so I think it took me two years or something. And that's kind of really when I made a decision to um, pursue, pursue my work, pursue my art, because I thought, you know, I'm not gonna ever know if I don't just pour myself into it. I mean, this is what I've always wanted to do, but always had to have a job or was, you know, taking care of my kids. And I thought, I'm just not gonna ever know if I can make this succeed if I don't just jump in there and do this. And so it was at that time that I made that decision. And when I made that decision, it was, I actually went from a different way of working with clay. Because before how I was trained, I was trained as a, as a potter, you know, and I wasn't really that good at it. I mean, I was adequate. I can throw pretty adequately, but I'm not, you know, you see a lot of people that can just sit down and they just, this is very natural for them to throw. But so when you it talk took about a lot of throwing, training. I'm talking about throwing on the wheel okay. and making functional uh, right. cups and bowls and all this kind of thing. And it was at that time, you know, when I made that decision to, you know, dwell into my trying to make art as a living, that I decided also to just make things that were more narrative in nature than to make things that are functional anymore. Right. And were you also talking about working not so much with earth and wire as working more with ceramics? Well, I had always used stoneware. Stoneware. Uh, prior to. So actually, what I use now is kind of the opposite. I use, uh, well, sometimes I use porcelain, but mostly I use an earthenware clay. I see. Since it's not going to be used for any you know, particular function. Right. Um, so when you decided you were going to get serious about this and you had graduated, did you set any specific goals? Like, I'm not going to enter such and such a show, or I'm going to finish so many pieces of work, or was it just I'm going to get up every day and... I had a strategy. Okay. <laughs> I thought I thought okay, I'm going to uh, try to get a show at the Southern Plains Museum because I knew they did that wonderful catalog and that that catalog went out to all kinds of places. Good idea. You know, they had a had a huge mailing list, and so that was my first strategy. And I had a strategy of uh, doing some of the shows and you know markets. Um, and I think the first thing that I did was the Kansas. Lord show at Haskell, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then um, and how was that? What was that experience like? Your first it was great show. It was great. I can't remember. I mean, I think first shows I did like little, you know, just even little bitty shows, you know, like just things that were at malls, arts and, and crafts, uh, yeah. fairs, mm -hmm. and, and those what, weren't always so great because you, you know um, people aren't really there to they're there to shop. They're not there to buy <laughs> art, you know, and. So there was, I mean, it was lean, you know? They didn't, you didn't sell that much, but you learned a lot. Yeah, and it can kind of make you uh, question, as you say, people are there really for uh, the commercial stores, mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. it makes you a little so bit worried about, about those kinds of things, you know? <laughs> and, um, gosh, I, I don't even know how long I've been doing in New Market. Well, you know what, it was, I, I started doing Indian Market the year after they, like people that are, the last year that they grandfathered people in, I'm the next year. Okay. So. Okay. It's, it's 20 something years. Yes. What kinds of um, things were you doing when you started out? They were non-functional pieces. They were non-functional pieces. They were um, a lot of little figures and uh, I, I did a whole series of these little clay boxes and then inside the clay boxes would be like these little figures or these little animals and a lot of them were just based on um like a lot of them might be little like little figures you know like a mother and children i mean it was just based on my life basically you know what i was going through as a as a mother and a human being and um raising your kids there were um gosh what are they? oh i've always i kind of got into doing these platters you know that I, and i still do them today but they've transformed so much from the those first platters that I did. And I used a lot of uh, ribbon work designs and then kind of abstracted them. You know, and I had to come up with a palette. So did a lot of things with terra sigillatas and coloring terra sigillatas with pigments um, to come up with a, a palette that I was you know pleased with and that would work for me. 
And can you explain that term, terra sigillata? Terra sigillata is a Greek word that means stamped earth. <laughs> and it's a, a clay slip, a very fine clay slip, that you, you just mixed earthenware clays and then uh, you let it set, you put a defloctoin in it, like uh, well, I, what I used was uh, Calgon. And then, you know, and it, it will separate the clay. And so after about a, four days, you take a, a siphon and it'll be like a watery, very clear mixture and you siphon that off. And that's kind of like all the decay and everything comes to the top. Mm -hmm. And so you siphon that off and what's kind of left in the middle, then the very, the clay actually um, goes to the bottom, you know. It's, it's real thick down there. So that middle layer is a real fine, fine clay. It's like milk almost. And you can take that and you can put pigments in it and then you can put that on. Um, on top clay. of it. Mm -hmm. When it's leather hard or you can spray it on like after you fire it. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Greek pots, that red and blood, that, that's, that's what terra sigillata is. So it's like a real ancient technique, <laughs> which most of the clay Techniques are hard, you know, they're right. just they're, uh, things that people have been using forever. Right. So, um, I think I remember the first things that I saw of yours, and I didn't know they were yours, they were parflesh bags. Oh, and I, was I like, did that oh, a long time. So See, you I never forgot about that. Yeah, I did the parflesh bag <clears throat> for, quite a bit, for quite a while. But they um, were always, even the platters that you made, always sort of wall pieces or mm -hmm. non-functional, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the part flushes, you know, I have this interest in uh, things we carry and things mm -hmm. that you put inside things. And my interest really more than just, you know, I'm showing you like the purses or the dresses or the uh, the things that have kind of evolved out of those early years. You know, what, what I'm really interested in is how people carry things. You know, I use those for a metaphor, actually, that, that, that you are actually carrying this, like, purse or you're actually you know this our flesh that we use them to carry and to store and it was more of a metaphor of uh, our culture you know during those times and and how what we made to to take care of ourselves yeah and I think it's um wonderful a couple of in a couple of ways one is you know you're showing us that these traditional uh, these cultural items are works of art whenever you're translating them into a piece of clay that, um, you know, Western eyes are definitely going to see as a work of art. You're showing us that those are uh, works of art as well. But also it just reminds me of that, you know, that everything has a spirit in it. So already mm -hmm. you're, sh you're kind of doubling that emphasis in a way. Was that part of your message, sort of, in terms of showing these cultural items, but now they're in clay, because the clay, of course, has that spirit. I don't know if you... Well, I don't think you... I. My belief when you work with clay, and it, it's pretty deep, but that you don't, you don't, you know, intellectualize it every single day that I go to the studio. But it, I mean, if I have to sit down and start thinking about it, it's, 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 it's a really deep thing. Because clay, um, of course, you know, this is the earth. that It holds us up. You know, and, and that's why I think when I work with kids, I mean, they know exactly what to do with clay. I just have to stand there and provide the clay. I don't really have to show them anything. Now, of course, I do. I mean, I have, you know, I have a little, you know, I have, I have a little agenda with them. But, you know, it's they still are very close to the earth, and they understand that connection to the earth very well. And, you know, somewhere along the line, that's where we forget it, you know. And so when you work with clay... It's like it's like the earth has this ability to um, allow you to use it. Are we have are we allowed the ability to, to use the earth and to transform it into something else? I mean, it's it's I don't know I don't really know how to verbalize it even, but yeah, there is some transformation that takes place when the earth allows you to create with it. And you know, especially if I'm at the studio for just days on end, you know, like really you know making something and and. Uh, touching the clay all day long. Sometimes when I come home, you know, I, I still have that feeling in my hands of, of I'm touching the I'm touching this material, this moist earth. And it, it doesn't it doesn't just go away when you stop working. You know, it's 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 very um, it's very close. 
I'm still with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that answered your question or yes, not, but it, it does. Thank you. That was a, a, I'm glad you shared that. Thinking about the stories or the narrative element which interests you, is it important for the piece to tell the whole story or part of the story, or do you ever think about that very much, or is it just I, I don't I don't believe it's important for me to show everything. In fact, I do a lot to kind of um, distort exactly what I'm trying to say because sometimes it's so very personal, and as a human being, you know, just as I, I'm kind of uh, quiet and um, keep things you know to myself. I'm, I'm a private person, I guess that's what I want to say. And unless you really know me, you know unless you know me really well or I'm very close to you, I'm not the person to just, you know, kind of tell all or anything. So actually in my work, I kind of think of myself like that too also. I'm, I'm, I don't have to let you know everything it is I'm trying to say. And so I may even take, you know, um, pains to distort that message a little bit so that I'm really still the person who's the secret belongs to. And, and if you can kind of jump online with me somewhere, and understand what it is I'm trying to say, that's great. And, and people usually do, you know, I, I think people are very insightful and they can, they they look at, you know, especially people who love art and love work, and love, love looking at artwork, they they can get that, that gesture that you're trying to, um, you know, that expression that you're trying to make, they understand that. Right. Make it their own in a, in a different yeah. way. Yeah, for like, so like on some of my work I, I you know, my oldest son, Yadika, is a painter, and uh, he left Oklahoma when he was 18, when he graduated high school, and he's he's 29 now, so he's been, out, he's been in the East a long time, and he went to Boston to art school, but he got real involved in that graffiti crew. <laughs> and, you know, I, he was young, and so um, I went out there, I thought, well, I'm going to go check on him, you know? And, <laughs> And uh, I said, oh my gosh, you're so lucky, I'm an artist. I mean, they, they had these just wonderful, him and his crew, you know, these guys that he ran with, they had these notebooks. I mean, they were just full of like, you know, documenting, not just their work, but work of it. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. Wow. It was amazing. And so I was influenced by those guys, you know? And, and when I came back, I started like writing uh, distorted messages on my work. Interesting. You know? So um, more more graphic. More yeah, graphic. and I thought, oh my gosh, what the perf what a perfect, uh, and you know, and those guys will tell you. I mean, at least Jataka will tell you that it's not about actually what you're putting on there, but it's a lot about movement mm -hmm. and energy, and uh, it, it, he describes it like a dance. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I'm always open to learning. I mean, I want to be a lifelong learner. I want to just you know, <laughs> I want to learn something. I want to know something else, and and I think you know we we can learn a lot from these young people and so I'm influenced all the time by all kinds of things you know what you see what you hear what's going on where you're at and but I'm, what I'm really interested in is that jest of what it is what information I'm taking in mm -hmm. so it doesn't always have to be exactly what I see you know it's just what it, what is the uh, what's really happening here you know, I ask a lot of questions. You know, um, when I think about ceramic, like I, cultural items, sort of, I, I remember Bell Glass doing some rattles at some point, but, and I know it's hard to establish first and stuff, but I don't really remember seeing a lot of translation into clay um, of traditional clothing or those, those types of things. Um, do you think you were one of the first artists in, at least in Oklahoma, I guess, to be doing that? Well, I know Korea, you know, you made, have... Korea Coffee made um, leggings out of clay. Okay. So, I don't think so. I think we have to give that credit to Korea. Okay. You know, in terms of footwear and all so that kind of thing. So, she was doing know. those in the yeah. mid-80s or early yeah. 80s. Yeah, 70s even, I think. Okay. You know. um, but that's, a good, that's a good influence to kind of yeah. have out. Yeah. But clothing, you know, when I was talking earlier about that, learning how to sew when I yes. was so young, and then learning how to make, you know, I would say traditional clothing, and then when my children is an age where I started making traditional clothing for them, 
um, those kinds of influences and what I was you know talking about earlier like well what's really going on here what's really happening you know yes I'm making something traditional for my clothing but it's so much deeper than that it's it's and I mean I understood totally you know what my grandmother went through her whole lifetime of acquiring Osage traditional clothing for us or having it made um, you know, when I was able to do that for my own children, that was very clear to me that it's, it's, it's wanting you to participate and know who you are. It's wanting you to um, be able to be involved in the dance. It's wanting you, it's, it's wanting, it's, it's just an expression of love, you know, for our children, our families, and our, our uh, extended families, and the relationships that we have with one another. And they even signal, you know, in Osage clothing, I mean, when a woman was, when you gave, you know, my grandmother had this wonderful collection. Her most prized possessions were these Osage traditional clothing. And so I would ask her, you know, we would talk about them. You know, we would look at them and we would talk about them. And, I, you know, especially hand blankets. I'd say, well, where did you get this? You know, and tell me the story of how you got this. And it's, well, um, you know, my, my, uh, they, they have uh, relationships. Yes. You know, we have we have our clan relationships, and you have relationships with you know extended family, and so it's not just you know your um, your first cousin is actually your brother, right. you know, and your aunt and uncle are actually your mother and your father, and so um, she would talk about you know members of, of her extended family like that, and she said, well they they had that made, and they gave that to me, or when someone passed on, this was given to me, you know, in this way, and so. Again, you know, there's just more going on there than this actual exchange. It's it's defining a relationship, right. and that is the part that I find so interesting. I mean, it, it's all a very beautiful thought of how that manifests itself into an article of clothing, right? And that's the part that I find really fascinating about it. You've devised a finish that really works especially well for the um, buckskin dress dress series that you did. Can can you talk a little bit about how you get the effect of you know something that actually looks like buckskin? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, first of all, when the piece is leather hard, I take a, a, a clay slip and um, uh, a, a series of sponges and just dip them into that clay slip and then uh, kind of press it all out and then press that on there so it has uh, a texture that's similar to buckskin. And again, you know, I don't think I would know what the texture of buckskin really was unless I had actually made a pair of moccasins or, you know, had, uh, I mean, I had, my grandmother had a little buckskin dress made for me when I was very young. And I wouldn't know what the texture of buckskin is unless I had that closeness to actual wearing buckskin or making right. buckskin leggings for my children or, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, and then once I have fired it, I would uh, build a little outdoor kiln, um, either with bricks or dig a hole, uh, but most of the time just do it in a trash can. And it's a sawdust firing where you add sawdust to, um, in layers, mm -hmm. and then you uh, ignite it on the, so it was very, it was very, um, after a while, you know, I could kind of control it. Yes. In the beginning, I couldn't really, I didn't really know what I was doing until I did it several times. But when I got to the point where I could control it, you know, with paper and with different layers of sawdust and different kinds of sawdust and, and adding different things that ignite, you know, different materials that ignite or different organic materials, you know, that I could ignite, then I could kind of control. I know if you've seen pictures of it, um, you know, they're kind of waves, or they yes. kind of go up and down like this. Yes. And I could take that flame to exactly, you know. Now, that was still very um, surprising, but I at least had a little bit of control over it, you know, to where I could kind of make these layers start happening. So it was, uh, they were salt as fired. Tom has um, always helped by photographing your work. Does he help with your art business side in any other ways? Um, not really. If we go like, uh, well, he's accompanied me on a couple, you know, of uh, video exhibits in the East and markets that we did a couple times in the East. And so they've always, everybody's helped me. It's 
it's a big deal to you know to move ceramics, especially. Yeah. So, uh, especially the older I get, I have to really rely on everybody. <laughs> like, you know, all all my kids help me in Santa Fe and um, help me set up, help me take it down. Um, but I told them also, I said, you know, everybody benefits from this. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> trickle down effect. I mean, everybody needs to do your, you know, do your share. So. so they've all helped me. My whole family has always helped me, you know, in terms of getting the work there, getting it set up, you know, helping me stay there for several days and um, photographing it, all that kind of, you know, all that kind of thing. How important have um, museum shows been in terms of your career? I think they've been um, really important extremely important I mean, getting the opportunity to show in a museum uh, or show in a, an exhibit that's important uh, has been absolutely um, gosh you know just really a jumping off point in terms of significance and um, having people look at your work critique your work being, having the opportunity to show with so many wonderful other artists, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, when, uh, when you're in this business and you just, you're just making your work, you're going to the studio, you're doing the work, you're immersed in it, it's hard work, physically it's hard work, you know, working with clients right. is really physically very hard, you know, what I do over there, and so, um, you know, when you arrive at the gallery or you arrive at the museum, you know, and everything's all beautiful, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it just takes you aback when you walk in there. I mean, because it's presented in such a beautiful manner, you know, in the way that it, You kind of see it anew. Yeah, absolutely. Or if I have, uh, several times I've had, you know, the opportunity to visit somebody's home that, you know, my piece is, especially something that's a big major piece, you know, and, and I know this, I don't remember what we were talking about earlier, but I, it made me think about it. And that was, oh, was it when you asked the question, you know, how important is it for you to show um, what, what it is that you really, the expression you're trying to make is, well, sometimes I'll walk into somebody's home and I'll look at that piece and I'll think, I, I know what that was about. I don't think I knew that right at that minute. You know, I mean, it becomes very clear to oh. me, you know, what, what I was really trying to say that I really wasn't even aware of at that moment. Mm. But yeah, the opportunity to show a museum show is is a, is a it's a wonderful opportunity. I remember there was a period when um, three dimensional work just became super popular, and I can't remember if it was like the early nineties. It it was just a big shift away from sort of wall art when everybody was looking for three dimensional work. Um, I was wondering if you felt like an uptick in demand during those years, or um, if you've ever relied on galleries that heavily where it would have impacted um, you in that way. I guess I've just never really thought about it that way. Um, I've always kind of made a living of, of doing you know several things like galleries, museum shows, and the markets. And then I don't even do, I never have done that many markets because I couldn't keep up with the um, inventory like that. Typically. And then if something got real popular, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this isn't the Anita factory. You know, I mean, I was, I, I would feel that way sometimes. And I thought, my gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's no fun really to kind of reproduce this, and, you know, in a different manner even. I mean, after a while, I just, I don't, um, it just wasn't fun anymore. Sure. It, just, it was not the original idea. It just it had done its time, you know. So, so I found, you know, like trying to do the markets, like it was really hard to, to come up with that kind of inventory, uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, because typically for Santa Fe, you take what? How many pieces? I have always had a like a low end, you know, kind of thing that helps me get there and get, helps me get home and helps me pay for my hotels and all that kind of thing, um, but. I think I take, um, you know, excluding that kind of small thing, maybe um, six or seven pieces. Mm -hmm. Major pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, that's a big... it's really hard to balance your life and your studio work. 
Because, you know, I, I don't think the general public really has any idea what goes into making something out of clay. You know, the, the time that is involved in it, um, the drying process, the firing process. And then, you know, you can go through that whole process and it may not even make it out of the kiln. So it's, it's a very involved process. And that, ba that, that ability to balance is really important to you. Yeah, because, I, you know, I have a family. I have, um, I'm, I'm very involved in um, the Osage art, art community. I serve as a cook um, for our current drum keeper, and I was a cook for our drum keeper uh, previous to him. And so that's a commitment, you know, during this commitment. all of June <laughs> that, I, you know, I, I love doing and our, our kids all come home. And, and so pretty much June, I, you know, I don't do red earth anymore. And I haven't done it for a long, long time because of that very, it just, just June is out of the question. Right. You know. So just um, backtracking a little bit to your artist in residence work. Um, what was uh, one of the benefits of doing that? I understand you you don't do it as much anymore, but you're still on the roster mm -hmm. for Oklahoma. Well, it's, it's a very rewarding. It's a very rewarding experience to be able to work with um, young people and um, excellent teachers. Uh, it's just a really it's a it's a it's just a really wonderful experience. I get a lot of just, you know, I think I get more than the kids get from me. I get rewarded by them uh, because they, you know, what I talked about earlier was that they have this connection to the earth and they understand it and they haven't lost that and it's it's very close to them. And so um, it's just a joyful experience to be able to watch them to create, you know, things out of clay. And um, we work in a very, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in them knowing is, is what art is that it's not make and take and it's not, you know, that you just do exactly what I do here and that it's, 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 um, it's an expression of who you are and, and uh, how you see the world and how you see things. And so we, I, I try to accomplish that in a, in a number of ways by just reading a story to them or we go outside and have an experience and then, you know, take this lump of clay and just tell me how you felt about that or what you saw or, or, um, you know, I used to do six weeks residencies over at Edmond, where I see, so I'd see those kids a lot, and it got to where I, I was just running out of ideas. Like, what are we, <laughs> what are we gonna do here? And so, I, sometimes on Monday morning, I would just give them the clay and say, "Show me what you did this weekend," and it was amazing, you know, what they would make out of clay. It was so beautiful and so touching, and. Uh, and so it's a good learning experience for everybody. Then teachers can see, you know, that, that it's not always about make and take. There's a place for make and take. I have, you know, I'm not opposed to like people, like a teacher standing up there showing somebody how to make something because there's a place for that too. But there's also, uh, I think it's just really important that young people know what the act of creating is all about, about, you know, what making art is. And that there's so many aspects to that and all these facets of it. and that they can plug into that for a little bit. You know, there's not, you know, in school, it's just so um, demanding of them. And so for them to have this time where they can make those decisions, how I want something to be, is it's important. So it's very gratifying to be able to do that. You um, have described yourself as a kind of quiet person, but I noticed you have been doing a bit of public speaking lately. <laughs> And you gave a keynote address at the American Indian Studies Conference in 2009. Is that, how do you approach that? Is it easy or hard or? It's, it's hard. Um, and, and I am asked to, you know, um, or if you're at a museum exhibit, I mean, or to write about your work, you know, all of, all of the, all of the above. <laughs> That's, that, that, that is hard for me because as an artist, you know, I make that expression through my material. And, and that is my expression and that's how I do it, you know. And so I'm probably not going to ask a writer to make something, you know, to explain to me what you wrote about through making something. So that part of it is, is very difficult. And sometimes it just takes days to pull those words out of yourself, you know, and, and, and to try to be um, exact 
so that people will, it will be very clear what you mean, that that's very difficult. But I also look at it as um, a great opportunity to be able to, um, you know, t tell people a a about about you or um, about yourself or about what, not, not so much about myself, but I think what it is that motivates me, you know, what, what it is that, um, why I do this. And then, you know, that, that can be really, really hard to do. <laughs> but I think, you know, for me, what works best is just to be honest, you know, and if people are interested in that, then they are, and if, if they're not, that's okay too. But um, I, I can only be honest, I can only talk about what it is I do, how I do it, why I do it, you know, what's in my, it's, it's right there in my own backyard. You are working on a commission for the one of the Quapaw casinos at the moment. Can you explain what that involves? <laughs> well, it involved um, doing some research about the Quapaw people, and um, you know, I, I knew a little bit because uh, my grandmother had some extended family members that were Quapaw, and um, have quite a few friends who are Quapaw, and have spent some time up that way. But uh, it involved quite a bit of research, um, and luckily I had uh, the opportunity. You know, as an artist, I just have so I'm so thankful that I've had been given the opportunity to have some just really wonderful experiences that I wouldn't have had in any other job. You know, and some of those include uh, a lot of recent trips with the Osage Nation up to our original homelands, and doing some work in Missouri, and um, getting to visit you know traditional. Um, some sacred sites, you know, for Osage people with the Cultural Preservation Office out of uh, the Osage Nation Cultural Preservation Office. And then also like during all that Lewis and Clark, you know, there was a lot of activity going on up there and I got an <laughs> opportunity to be a little part of that. And so um, those kinds of experiences just add to what it is that how I see things and how, you know, that information, um, percolates inside of me, you know, and why, how am I going to use that at a later date? Or travel, or, you know, given the opportunity to travel someplace absolutely wonderful that I never would have got to go there unless I was an artist. And so, um, gosh, what did you ask me? <laughs> so, with your, um, what you're working on for the casino at the moment. Oh, so, kind of out of some of those experiences, I've had the, I had had the opportunity to actually see a huge collection of their um, pottery. And so, um, you know, just, I spent a long time in, in, in uh, one of their collections of before this opportunity ever came up. And so, so then when this opportunity came up, and then they have some books that they actually loaned to me, um, you know, very wonderful old books that they loaned to me also to be able to do some research. And so, oh my gosh, it took me quite a while, you know, to come up with two or three projects that I thought would be appropriate for them. And one that we could all agree on that, you know, I thought, you know, and of course, so their pottery is a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful expression of, of how they can see their past, you know, this collection of pottery that exists today. And, and of course it, it, it also has, um, you know, how that was acquired. I mean, all of, all of that goes into, you know, what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, as we know, that wasn't always the best of terms and, and how these things were acquired and who got them and where they went. I mean, those are still things that people are dealing with. So that all kind of goes into that mix of, you know, how, how you see this. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like everything else in this life, you know, it's the good and bad, and it's, 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 it's a balance of, of everything. Um, so, um, you know, I thought well, that was one of the, a, a good way. So kind of, I didn't, I didn't want to take their designs just verbatim, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking right. to earlier right. also, but there's, they're very basic designs in there that people, you know, have used all over. I mean, they're just very basic human designs that are used in all kinds of cultures and all kinds of, in, throughout history, throughout time, but they're unique to them.
in that you know they came up with these certain designs and so I wanted to think of those designs and kind of in terms of that that they're these you know basic designs that are used everywhere but so I kind of wanted to abstract them a little bit so that I weren't exactly using their designs because I don't know what their designs were what those were utilized for and what their importance was for them so I didn't want to just exactly use some you know the designs like that but um, I, I know when I showed them certain parts of it, you know, because there's a hundred pieces, over a hundred pieces to it. So just in some of our meetings that we've had recently, you know, I didn't show them. Um, but again, you know, they 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 saw it. They saw it. You know, they they saw those elements right. of of their designs, and just use the basic colors. You know, that that are again used out kind of like just from Greeks to you know uh, pop pottery. Right. Um, to Pueblo pottery too, you know, they're, they're, they're the design, they are the colors of the earth. You know, they are what's available to us in whatever geographic region that we come in. So I wanted to, to stay on that. But I also, you know, wanted to be true to myself and add, you know, that I made this, you know, I don't want it to be just a replica of, you know, something yes. that you would see in a, a historical setting or a museum or a collection, you know, an anthrop anthropological collection or archaeological collection so um, they're all going to have gold uh, on the back of them and on the edges so that that gold can reflect because these are very precious to them in their history so I do too that one. <laughs> I do too I don't know I mean it's just kind of part imagination you know I mean it's just and that's another thing I mean I have to um, sometimes go to a place that I'm not sure how this is going to look but I have to rely on that part of me, I have to always go to that place where I believe in this process. Right. You know, I, I believe that, I believe in this process and I believe in where it's going to take me is right. So you um, order your clay probably, or do you ever date any of your clay? No. Okay. I do, I do use, you know, like um, the red clay here in Oklahoma for uh, slips and uh, surface um, slips sometimes not all the time I mean we have such beautiful red earth here that it's hard to ignore it but um, I make my clay um, actually Negosi helps me no, I would say in the last couple of years Negosi makes my clay <laughs> uh, the bags are 50 pound bags you know I have a recipe of clay that I like to use and so they come in 50 pound bags and then there's this huge mixer over there at the studio that you pour them into. You know, it's a very lengthy process. And so a couple of years ago, I, you know, I, I actually can still go in that storeroom and I can, but it's hard. Oh, yes. That's, to lift a 50 pound right. bag. <laughs> and so I just thought, you know, when Yadika comes home and then Negosi and I just, we finished, we made about 600 pounds of clay a couple of weeks ago. And um, that will last you. <laughs> that will last me for quite a while. And when I was making that clay, that clay, that, even with the mixer, it was like a whole day process for me. You know, I would make the clay, and then I would have to rest, and then I would have to like, you know, uh, sack it up, sack the clay up, and that was another. Then I have to rest after that, and then it was like another. I think that night, late at night, I would go in there, I would clean the mixer because it takes <laughs> it would take me, you know, a couple hours to clean that mixer. But with, with my young son there, it's just nothing to him. Have you? You've already sort of touched upon the fact that you have not ever been interested really in in doing any straight pottery, so. Um, but we had you have uh, mentioned um, that firing is kind of this act of faith because you never know if the piece will make it, um, and experimenting to sort of get some right combinations. Are are larger pieces more of a gamble than smaller pieces, or does it? I I think so. I mean, you've invested a lot of time into them. And um, but but you go ahead, and <laughs> you go ahead and do it, and it feels absolutely wonderful when uh, I think last summer when I, I I made the biggest platter I've ever made, and there was not how a, big was it? Mm, I think it was about you know about like this. I don't remember how many inches it was. Uh, Almost like three feet. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't quite that big, yeah. but um, there was not a flaw on it. 
you know, I mean, I, I turned it over and I thought, I just can't, uh, there's got to be something here, you know, there's got to, because also you'll come up with these little, you know, they're not crack all the way through, but they're called like surface cracks. And sometimes you just stretch the clay too much when you're using some of those tools or you've just gone over it too much, you know, and it'll just cause a little tension there and, and you'll have like it. So it's like just very small, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't see any. I thought, oh, I just can't get over this, you know, because this is the biggest thing I've ever attempted to do in terms of, you know, those platters. Uh, so, there, you know, and so you could, like, I mean, I mean, I could, I could make something that big. I could, you know, do the surface decoration or whatever it is I'm going to do to it. You know, and most of my firings are like require two to three to four firings. So you put one surface on, then you fire it, then you put another surface on, then you fire it, then you put another surface, you know, so it's, it's, it's like that. And so I know in my heart that when you do this, now you're not intending for anything to happen to it at the end, but that, that yes, this, this could totally crack into two pieces or three pieces, or there could just be something so horribly wrong with it that it's not gonna be um, usable at the end, but you do it anyway. You know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop doing this process because it may not make it through. You know, so what you said that it is, it's a, it's an absolutely an act of faith. You know, to do this. When you, um, I notice it's kind of been difficult uh, for ceramic sculptors in a way, which you are doing, because sometimes they want to put you in one category or another at a competitive show. Um, they want you either to be in the sculpture category or the ceramic category, and there's sort of a drawback, of course, if you're not sort of judged on the merits of this very particular um, form. Uh, have you run into that in competitive shows? Have you felt like your work really maybe wasn't fairly evaluated, or do you feel like... Uh, no, I haven't. I think they have. I think now, you know, they have them. Pretty, it's pretty clear what is what is. They've what. got some. Yeah. I know at Santa Fe Indian Market, they've they've got this some very tough competition out there. <laughs> very good, <laughs> well defined categories. Yeah. <laughs> Can you explain? Um, you've explained the process of slips a little bit that you put these different stains and oxides in there to get certain kinds of color, but I'm wondering. Um, so if you want to deepen a color, is that just a process of going back again with the same color slip and it'll get a little darker or? I use kind of a, like, <clears throat> a, well, I use a lot of commercial underglazes too because they're very stable. Okay. Um, but I also, like there's a, I have one slip that I, I really like that for me is very stable also. And so it's, it's a white base and then I can mix, you know, these pigments into it. And they, they are, some of them are commercial pigments, some of them are not. Some of them are just the raw materials. Um, but, you know, to come up with a palette, you just do a, a, it's like an experiential type of thing. And so you have a certain amount of this slip and you add, you know, a certain amount of this oxide, but you do that like in a series of, um, you know, 10 experiments with the same oxide to see exactly what you're gonna come up with. I see. And then you just, you label that, and then you have a notebook, and so it's like going back to that notebook, going, well, if I want it to be this, and you also have the sample, you know, like you fire it, and you go, well, this is what I want, so, but that doesn't mean that's what you're going to get, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it depends on the batch of oxides and all this kind of thing, so, but I, I also, you know, in addition to that, I use a lot of um, underglazes, commercial underglazes, because they're, they're very stable. How do you think your approach to working with clay has changed over the years? Mm -hmm. I don't think about that too much. I, I think that... Um, I think that I have um, experimented with this material enough to have a pretty good idea of what it is I want to say and to be able to um, do it in a way that I'm real comfortable with. Uh, at the same time, 
I wish that I, I would be more experimental and you know maybe uh, find uh, another way of working that I'm not so comfortable with that may bring me some delightful surprises. But um, I'm also comfortable enough with what I do that I can have an idea of what it is I want. You know, I can have an imagine. You know, in my in my imagination, I can think I, w I want to say this. So I'm going to do A, B, and C to get there. But then when a C actually comes down to you know, I'm sitting there with my squirt bottles <laughs> and my underglazes, and it's time to actually put you know that image onto the clay canvas or whatever I have prepared for myself to be able to do that that I feel comfortable enough to just go with it, you know. And uh, for instance, that happened, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I was so happy with what came out. You know, I was just like, this is better than I even imagined it to be, you know. And But then at the same time, the next night, you know, I wasn't so happy with what happened there, you know, at that time. So the, the piece that I was so excited about turned out to be not the piece at all. It was this other one, you know. And so I, I think, you know, it's just this evolution that takes place with you as an artist can be subtle and sometimes it can be very bold and sometimes it can be just, you know, um, um, it, it's just this evolution process. And I always have always really enjoyed it when I, you know, there's an artist that I love that I can follow their work and, I, and you visually... You just see that over the years. You just you just see this, how they develop from that to this. Yes. And and I think you know I, sometimes when I can go through my own you know starting with slides that we don't even use anymore, you know to images on the internet you know I, I can I can see that, you know within my own work. It's not something that you really sit down and think about too much because we're always so busy with other things, but. Um, it's, it's a combination of that process, you know, the, the, the physical process, the materials, understanding them, knowing them, these techniques, you know, that you pick up along the way, and then also that process that we were talking about earlier of, um, you know, information that has come through you and to you, and um, it's from that moment of, uh, you know, taking a needle and thread and sewing with that material that, it, it, I can tell you it was blue and white and gingham little checks, you know, uh, and learning how to sew. To every experience that I've had of uh, being a mother and, ha you know, having children and uh, being a granddaughter and being a daughter and being, a, you know, all of these things, um, all this information, you know, wells up within you and then you're able to make this expression. It's just, it's all of those experiences up to this very moment in time. And you've sort of um, drawn in broad uh, outline for us what to your creative process is a bit, but I wonder if you can just review that a bit from the time you get an idea for a piece. Do you keep track of those ideas in a notebook? How does that? I do, and I also am a terrible person, like just write on scraps of paper. <laughs> um, the, and then you put those in a certain place, or I try to, you know, but sometimes they just get all, you know, jumbled up. But um, I keep, uh, well, I have all these little notebooks, and I keep a notebook in my purse, and um, um, I, I am a really bad, like scraps of paper you know and um, so I keep extensive notes on especially if I travel you know it's, it's not so much it's about like where I'm at or um, the landscape I'm real interested in the landscape uh, I've had the opportunity you know to go to some really wonderful places and um, I, I think it's real interesting you know to me the landscape holds a memory and then as a, as a culture as a modern culture you know what do we do with that landscape I mean you know, here in the United States, I've, I have found it's pretty typical of them to want to obliterate, mm -hmm. you know, these landscapes that, that have this really important information about our indigenous cultures that have been here. When you go to some place like Mexico or uh, even, you know, um, places in Europe and other parts of the world, that indigenous landscape is, is it may be in ruins, but it's, it's there. You know, it's very, it's very... Um, very notable and it's it's appreciated and it's so it's so you get this um, 
kind of layering mm -hmm. of information and landscapes. You know, that it's, it's you can soak that in. So I, I, I find that very interesting. So I, I try to make note of that, you know, when I'm somewhere. And so how did that make me feel, you know? And so I, I keep kind of notes like that, that I can try to use, you know, at a later time, in addition to some sketching. And then, you know, I'll just, so, the, so those kind of thoughts will come to me and they'll stay there for a long time, you know, like maybe a couple of years. And, um, and I think, well, you know, so maybe I'll kind of work on those ideas that I, you know, that, that I've been taking note of for quite a while and try to do like a series of pieces like that. But I also, you know, do a lot of figurative work that I try to incorporate that kind of thought also with just um, my thought of what it is I'm trying to um, make this expression of, of being human, you know, with these little figures and this figurative type work. And it just, it varies, you know, how, it's like that, information is all stored there and you could just it could be endless what you could do with it so sometimes it's hard to even zero in on that you know and then i also i take great pleasure in um just making things you know it doesn't have to be about anything it just it just has to be about pattern and design Sometimes that's preparatory to even doing a piece. Yeah, I mean, I take great pleasure in that. I know my <laughs> my youngest son and <laughs> I, have, you know, these great conversations, and he's a, he's a great person to bounce ideas off of. And of course, he's very young, and, and I share so much of his ideas, you know. But, uh, you know, he's like, you, you should do this. You, know, you should like, do this real experimental. <laughs> I mean, I love that kind of work myself, you know. And... Uh, and one time I just looked at him and I said, you know, there is nothing wrong with making something beautiful. I said, there's nothing wrong at all in making something beautiful. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, because I was really like defending, you know, like, you know, I was like, and, and then I thought about that for such a long time. And I thought, oh my gosh, people have made beautiful things all throughout our history. Where would we be without people making beautiful things, you know, to inspire the world and to, um, we have to see beautiful things as human beings. <laughs> right. We have to see beautiful things. I believe That's there's enough ugliness in the world <laughs> that we have to have more beautiful things too, you know? Well, I had a question about whether you've ever collaborated, for example, with Yadiga. Um, these conversations with Nobuzi, I guess, they sound like collaborations of a type. But have you ever formally collaborated with no, but I think we're getting really close, you know, to some to some of those um, things. I, th I think maybe the timing has just not been totally right. Um, so we, we like uh, Yadika and I've really been talking about it lately, and then um, uh, Wilena and I just oh my gosh, this just happened the other day, and, and um, I had a dream that uh, well, my daughter came home about three nights ago, and she's she's a student at, at uh, Fort Lewis in. Durango and she's getting ready to graduate. She came home to do some field work for a paper, her senior thesis. And so she's doing some interviewing up in Osage County this week. And so that first night that she came home, I had this dream. And I dreamed that um, Tom and I have been to the BAMP um, Center for the Arts. We were there in, a, in a, an indigenous um, um, Read of, with other indigenous artists from, oh my gosh, they were from uh, Mexico, the United States, Canada. There were some Maori people there. There were, um, well, there was people from, you know, several different nations. And so the theme was uh, about, uh, let's see, what was it called? It was about Christianity and how it's impacted our communities. And, you know, however you want to, good or bad, you know, address that in your work. That's, that's what we were doing. So we were there, I was there for like, I think five or six weeks. And so uh, Nagosi was 12 or 13, 12, I believe. And so Tom brought him, uh, we took him out of school for a week and Tom brought him and they both, we all stayed there for a week together. And then I brought Nagosi home and Tom stayed for a while. 
So it, it was just the most fabulous experience in the whole wide world. I mean, it was beautiful there. And then just, you know, having that opportunity to be able to um, work with other indigenous artists. And I don't know, this, this, this center is just, it's just, it's just really wonderful. Anyway, I had this dream that, um, and they have a, they have a, they also have a, like they have studios of every, I mean, every medium is, you know, available to you there. And so there's studios, just these fabulous studios. And so they have a fiber studio also. And when I was there doing my clay work, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, it'd be so cool to come up here and like do, uh, you know, do some uh, upstate ribbon work, you know, like just, and you just really, have, you know, you, the only thing you have to do is you don't have to worry about your bills or, I mean, you can worry about them, but you know, you don't have to, you don't have to sit down and make your bills out at night or you don't have to be running to the grocery store or you don't, you don't have any commitment to anything outside of your work. And the beauty of nature around you and exploring that and exploring all of those things that's what's so wonderful about these residencies so i i dreamt that um her and i went up there to make ribbon work blankets and i told her you know the next morning, I, go, I think we need to apply <laughs> yes. for a residency up there because in my dream i told her i said now you know when we leave here you will know how to make a ribbon work blanket because <laughs> she's she's been you know like like through me and other ladies, she's been learning to do some ribbon work. But I just thought, oh my gosh, you would know you would know how to do from start to end, you know, that process. Because uh, we've been wanting to do that, you know, for a while. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, that would be so wonderful. I don't even know. I hope, like, I hope we're like all about that. that. that no, but, that's uh, a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> and um, oh, we were talking about uh, collaboration, yeah, so. Yeah, I think they're, you know, like, maybe he's a musician. You know, our youngest son is a, he's a very talented musician. And, um, yeah, you know, Yadika asked me not too long ago, he emailed me and said, you know, I'm, I'm applying for this thing. Do you want to collaborate? I said, let's do it. <laughs> Sounds, you know? like, Sounds like the time. Um, and you've incorporated photographs in your work. Mm -hmm. Have you collaborated formally with Tom to any degree or uh, on a couple of a couple of pieces, you know, but I think that that influence is, is really it's, I, I know um, the last one woman I show that I had when I walked into that gallery after everything was set up and I just thought, oh my gosh, this looks like a black and white photograph to me, you know, every tone of the grays and, and uh, all the hues that go into a black and white photograph, you know, were evident in my work and so it was at that time that I, you know, really felt this, this huge influence of um, photography onto my work. Um, you uh, enroll uh, at OSU and do uh, studio hours. Um, what is your um, creative routine when you, you have to kind of plan it around when you can use the space? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and I also, you know, I work over here, you know, at my, my home quite a bit. Too. Right. So, um, it, that, <laughs> you know, kind of this is what I require. <laughs> I require that I don't want, you know, I don't want to be interrupted. And uh, it was really hard when my kids were teenagers and having to go places and need to be things, you know, it was really, really tough. Um, you know, I tried to clear the calendar so that I can have at least three or four days of um, I'm just involved in this process and I'm and that's where I need to be and I have to tell people no to things and I, I've gotten way better at that I, I wasn't so good in the beginning you know or when I was younger um, my time is really precious to me and I usually listen to music you know put put um, I have an iPod and got some music on there and listen to it <laughs> what kind and, oh my gosh I listen to all kinds of music you know just um, Oh my gosh, I listen to the oldies, you know, I listen to rock and roll, I listen to indigenous music, I listen to punk war dance, I listen to peyote songs, I listen to some music I picked up in Africa, uh, all the blues, I like to listen to the blues, I listen, it's really pretty, you know, all over, and then, um, and then just get to work, you know, just, and I try to work on two or three pieces at the same time because of the process of clay. You know, things have to have a time where they're drying before you can go to the next step. So I try to have two or three pieces kind of in process. 
and then that might include, you know, you might have to start firing and, you know, spend a couple hours, you know, doing that and then go back to those pieces that I'm working on. So it's, it's, you know, I think the biggest part of that is just having to, having to say no, you know, and that includes, you know, like my family, like in Osage County, I, I have to say I can't do that because I'm working, mm -hmm. you know. And then there's those times when I'm not working that that's when I do all those other things. What's, um, what's one of the important forks in your life, do you think, forks in the road moment when you sort of chose to go this one direction, but you were looking at possibly another direction? Well, I don't think there's ever been any other direction that I wanted to go into, but it's, 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 the, it's to be an artist and to make art. I think even when I didn't, could not do that, it was always there. So there was really no other thing I really ever wanted to do except maybe be a poet. I mean, kind of like secretly I've always thought it'd be wonderful to be a poet, you know, but I don't have the talent to be a, to a poet, and I know that, so, you know, I, it's just kind of a secret, you know, longing and this admiration that I have for poets. Um, I would say really that's only the other biggest thing that I ever really probably, you know, longed for. But... Um, you know, in terms of kind of a, a fork in the road or, or a, an opportunity, you know, and, and that was like really self-imposed, like I explained earlier, was that, you know, it just was this, just, this longing was so big and, um, you know, the self-realization of um, the only person that can make that happen is you. And so you either try it or you don't, you know, and... Um, so, and, and that was very clear to me that you have to, you know, you have this choice to make. And so, I, you know, so I did that. I, I just went for it. And, um, and then in, in terms of, you know, opportunities that have come my way, you know, that I'm so ever very grateful for and thankful for are um, that exhibit uh, in Washington, D.C. It was Legacy of the Generations, Pottery by American Indian Women. And Susan Peterson, um, was the curator of that, and Susan Peterson was a very, uh, she's, she's not here anymore, but she was a very influential potter, writer, uh, curator. She wrote a lot of the books that are used as text, you know, in the uh, um, academ ac academic world of, you know, learning of the techniques of pottery. She wrote those, the, those books, you know, the textbooks, and um, so Susan Peterson had a long-standing relationship with a lot of Pueblo uh, women potters and came up with this idea that she wanted to show um, American Indian women's pottery but from the uh, aspect of uh, what ha you know where did they learn this you know where did this legacy come from and that then how that is passed down you know in, in these uh, women and in their families but along with that you know she was very interested in uh, the avant-garde she called them the avant-garde and like what contemporary women who are rooted in their communities are doing also and so being asked by Susan Peterson to be a part of that um, exhibit, you know, was really a, um, a jumping off point, I believe, in my career. What year was that? That was in, uh, oh my gosh, I had that book over there. Well, I think Yataka was about 16, you know, because he went, we, we took him. The, uh, Mobile Oil funded that that exhibit uh, at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in D.C. And they um, brought us out there for about a week and took us on these tours, you know. And, oh my gosh, there was this whole series of events and this huge, you know, black tie dinner. It was like being in a movie or something. It was... <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful yeah. experience. So, so it's point. been... Uh, Twenty-nine, I guess probably about fifteen or sixteen years ago. How about one of the low points in your career? Well, there's lots of those. <laughs> <laughs> there's everything from you know I didn't sell anything to um, 
I didn't get that grant or, you know, I got turned down, um, you know, I, and, and I have kept all of those letters, you know, everything that, because that's all part of it too. It is. And it's a time you know, consuming it's, part, isn't it? Yeah. The grant and it's really a blow, you know, when process. you don't, you know, you, you, you know, don't get awarded something or, um, but I don't know. It's just part of it. It's just, what are you going to do? You know, you're not going to quit doing it. So, but you know, there's a lot of those. Is there anything that we've forgotten to cover in our conversation that you'd like to talk about, or? Um, haven't. I, I don't think so. I think one of the things I was thinking about when we were, I don't even remember what part of it we were talking about, but, but um, that I kind of want to touch on because it's something in my current work, and that is, I, I did touch on that about the landscape and, you know, my, my feelings for how I feel about landscape and the earth and um but along with that is um the osage thought of um how how we look at the world you know which comes from our creation story and so i'm working quite a bit in that kind of thought and my interest in that is that you know that that's so very ancient and that's the thought of like duality and um you know in our creation story we came from the stars and we came to this earth and then you know, there was this division of the earth and the sky, and then out of out of that division came all of the clans. And um, but I think what's real interesting is is today how how that how that is how that thought is still here, how that perception is still here, and then how is that kind of you know um, what do we do with that? You know, what do we do with that information? I, I find that very interesting. Um, and so, kind of you know what I have. Um, where I'm kind of at with all of that now is that when I think about, you know, my grandmother or my aunties or the, you know, when I was a young person, um, people, you know, my grandmother and her contemporaries, they, they still spoke to each other in our language, you know, in, in, in our Osage language. And so I feel very fortunate to have kind of got in on the tail end of that, you know. So when I was a little girl riding around with them or, you know, going to social events with them, you know, they, they still spoke our language, and I would ask them, well, what are you saying, or tell me what you said, and then even as a teenager, you know, I would ask my grandmother to, to um, tell me what she said, you know, and it was very poetic, it was very beautiful, it was very um, expressive, um, you know, I, I found it to be very expressive, and so, you know, when I think about all of those kinds of things, and that kind of philosophy, and and I think that, you know, what really um, is that, uh, is that, you know, we were, we're left with a way of thinking, you know, with, with a way to, uh, a way of thinking. That, you know, I, I have a way of uh, looking at things and seeing things and it's, it's a way of thought. And it's kind of hard to explain, you know, but, but that's kind of how I see it all at this time. And so, so when I'm, you know, making these pieces about the landscape, or I'm making this person, you know, I'm, I'm trying to um, put that in there, you know, and, and, and have that be expressed some way. And it's, it's not always easy to put your finger on it, you know. It's, um, um, it's, it's just, it's kind of unattainable almost, you know. Right. And it's not exact, um, but that's that's something that I, I, I you know, kind of how I see it right now at this time. Well, we are going to take a look at a couple of your pieces. Okay. So I'll have you tell me a little bit about these pieces, if you would. Okay. This, uh, this piece is called While You Move Over the Earth, and these pieces were made for my children. So each one of them uh, is representative of each one of my children with a little iconic figure on the top that, you know, explains how I felt about them or um, what I felt they were connected to or something that would kind of um, be about them at that time. Because these are actually, um, these belong to my children. I'm just holding them. Wonderful. So they stay here because all, of course, none of them are subtle. <laughs> anywhere exactly you know but the one on the right is about Yadika and it has this little um, 
articulated figure on That's there. And when he was a teenager, he was, you know, well known for like getting all these little babies and taking their heads and limbs off and then re- you know, assembling <laughs> them. And so I thought that would be a good one for him. The one in the middle is about my daughter, Walena. And so it has a llama on there with these little tobacco leaves. Uh-huh. And uh, then on the bottom, there's some ribbon work uh, imagery on the little, you know, the little scooter place. And um, she, it's her dream to go to Machu Picchu and Peru. And so, you know, I thought that have to have those llamas. She loves llamas. <laughs> and, um, so that's about her. And then uh, the one on the left is uh, Nagosi. And it has this little bird because I always, as a young person, saw him as a very, very free spirit. But I actually, these pieces are called While You Move Over the Earth. And they're about, you know, from the time they were little children with all these little skateboards and wagons and things that had wheels and that moved them along. And then you see this kind of organic um, little mound there. And that's about them growing. And so then you have this long uh, tapered image uh, object there. And that, that's about their growth, you know. And um, I actually made these when uh, I saw images of when the war was just beginning. And if you remember those horrible mm-hmm. images that just kept coming over uh, the news about women, Afghani women who could not feed their children. And do you remember that mm-hmm. at the beginning? And it was just horrifying. I thought, oh my gosh, what would it be like not to be able to feed your children? And so I went out and made these pieces that most basic of you know because I thought oh my gosh it would just have to be the most horrible thing to ever go through not to be able to take care of your children so and they're they've got this all the wonderful detail on the sort of trunk of the and a lot of the uh, textures that you see in there are made with um, that's one thing I didn't talk about in technique and everything but how I come up with this imagery is I take, um, I make stamps out of things that are like, so you'll see my ribbon work patterns in there. You'll see this little beaded purse was given to me by my grandmother when I was a young girl. And so I've even made like stamps of using like the, um, the beaded, the beads in there. Wow. Yeah. I took tissue paper and clay and then just pressed the clay into there. So I would have, so I take, um, earrings or uh, just th- things that I go on a walk, you know, or these places I've been telling you about that I have the opportunity to go. If it's just something from nature, then I make a stamp out of it. And then I take, I have, so I have these boxes and boxes of stamps. And then when I will go to make this texture, I take a little mound of clay and, you know, uh, press it down and then take my stamps and then press it into there. And then I have like a little, um, you know, a little, um, fragment of clay with a stamped image on it and then I collage it on there and I think of this as this language that I have built for myself yes you know with these experiences absolutely uh, and that is the language that I have chose to make this expression you know just like this beautiful Osage language that I remember when I was a little girl and um, that's the expression that I make you know through my work so you know really my work looks so very contemporary to people you know, when they describe it. And, you know, I always get that question, well, this doesn't look very native to me, or, you know, this doesn't look very Indian to me. But, you know, if you, if I tell you all of these things that are embedded in there, you know, and that's what I was saying, that's, that's you know, my, you don't have to know all of that, you know, but th- that's held within me, but then I can make this expression to the world about it, you know, and so... Um, you know, I choose to work in a very contemporary way. That is a wonderful. All right, so this is this piece is called uh, Changing Thought in Black Dress. And this is from uh, the exhibit at TU called The Black Dress. And so this is um, all clay up here, but then down here we have um, um, fabric and then oil pastel. So I created this piece when I came back from, I had the opportunity to go to Italy and paint for three weeks to Tuscany. So uh, we have this distorted writing, you know, that I was kind of talking about right, earlier. Right, right. Um, which are my thoughts about uh, women and their clothing and how clothing transforms us. And um, this um, article of clothing can um, not only just make an expression of kind of who you are on the outside, but also 
how clothing has the ability to transform us. And then again, you know, with that thought of, well, when we get dressed up, what it is, we're, you know, we're going to something special and something important to us or an event or a situation that's very important that could be very happy or sometimes it's even a sad event. And again, kind of like, well, what is it we're really doing when we attend into you know, these functions? And what is it that information that you take home from something like that? So this has the... Um, I was had this opportunity to go to Tuscany and paint for three weeks <laughs> and, um, in the hillsides of Italy. It was really wonderful. And so, you know, we have this um, these trees over here, the cypress trees. And, oh, um, I see. People kept thinking they were feathers, but I said, no, they're, they're part of the landscape. And so, again, kind of um, doubling, you know, that information about the landscape and then... Right how that how that thought can be transforming for us as well and then putting yourself into a new environment a new place and then you know taking that with clothing and translating all that information into what it is we wear you know okay. and how we how we see ourselves and so that's what this piece is about. I'm really glad that you unwrapped that <laughs> yeah I, I'm actually making a white one now that's uh, going to be about the sun Oh, wow. And um, I think it's going to have lily ponds on the dress. Oh, wow. So I think this is a good example of um, what I've been saying about the landscape. Right. So this is an example of, uh, see, this, this is called, I have two of them, and actually these are called... Um, blank right now um, oh my god what are these called these are called something about like <laughs> red mound oh, okay can't think of it right now anyway these pieces are about the, they're actually about the mounds mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. in um, our original homelands mm -hmm. And so this is specifically about what I was talking about earlier about my feelings for the landscape and how the landscape holds a memory of the past cultures that were there. And um, then when you're able to visit those kinds of places, you know, being able to kind of tie into that and, and get a feel for the cultures who were there and how they affected us and how we're still here and have survived all that. But I think it's just very interesting and in how the landscape can, you know, hold that. So. These forms were made specifically after being able to travel to some of those places. And you're talking about some of the Osage sites specifically, mm -hmm. Osage mm -hmm. homelands. Um, and so we can see the stamp work on the bottom, um, which is really wonderful. And all, on the top, you've got a different kind of texturing going on. Mm -hmm. And that's I make that with uh, these little squeeze bottles with slip. And then also that red is the terrace gelata that I was talking about earlier. So, so these also kind of reference um, that Osage thought of the sky and the earth. And so that's why there's such a different uh, technique on the top as opposed to the bottom because I'm trying, you know, I'm thinking about that thought process too of how we see things from the sky and how we see things from the earth. And so that you have these little droplets of rain, you know, coming uh, that are you see these little bitty things that are you know kind of falling. And those are supposed to be indicative of rain. And even though this all is one landscape piece, you know, it, I want to have that uh, delineation of thought, you know, of the earth and the sky. Right, that polarity. Well, these are wonderful. And um, thank you so much, Anita, for taking time to Julie. talk with us. It was fun. <laughs>